Welcome to season two, episode 10 of the mixtape with Scott. Not only is this the 10th episode of the season, which feels like a special number, it's also the 44th episode of the entire podcast. Some might say 44 is a rare number because it only happens one time between zero and 100. So let's stop and celebrate what a special day it is today to have the 44th episode in this podcast. Who better for it to be with than the guests that we have today? But, 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 before I tell you who this guest is that I'm super excited about, we have to pause. Remember these special words by Sue Johnson, get ourselves in the mood, help remember what we're doing here. From her book, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, which by the way, is a good book about, you guessed it, love, adult romantic love. One of the greatest things you can experience in your lifetime. We use stories to make sense of our lives. We use stories as models to guide us in the future. And we shape those stories. And then those stories shape us. What an interesting statement that stories are like prisms that help us see our own lives. They function as lights to help us guide us into the future. And somehow, and this is the mystery, we shape them. And then they shape us. So the question is, how is this podcast shaping this person's story? And how is this podcast shaping my story? Well, that's what my podcast is about, regardless of whether it ever works. Maybe it's never worked, but that's what it's about. It's about personal stories of people, usually economists, though every now and then it'll be a non-economist too. And by now, you know, I am probably super into hearing and being changed by their personal story. I talked about them when they were a little kid. And because they're typically professional economists, we talk a lot about school. What were you like as a kid? What did you like to read? What was high school like? Why did you go to college? Why did you major in it? When's the first time you heard of economics? Why did you like that class? So on and so forth, right? We're economists. School's a big part of our life. So to hear this story and then potentially be changed by it, requires allocating your attention to this person, noticing their voice, small details that they mention, the things that they hover over and the things that they leave out. This is a person selecting little bitty things from an infinitely large number of facts, just a handful of details that to them are relevant for kind of given a broad shape of a life lived until now. So with that said, it's my pleasure today to welcome onto the podcast, Dr. Joseph Doyle from MIT. Uh, Dr. Joseph Doyle uh, has written many interesting papers to me on foster care, crime, and health. Uh, he's one of these people early on that was kind of using uh, very advanced causal methodologies kind of before anybody, particularly the judge fixed effects design. Uh, one of those papers became a favorite paper of mine. It was writ co-authored with Anna Azer, who was a previous guest last season, professor at Brown, where they studied the effect of being incarcerated as a kid on finishing high school and repeating crimes as an adult. The well-done causal study, and like many well-done causal studies, it can be very convincing, and because it is so convincing, it can break your heart. And that paper is always hurt when I teach it and can make me very emotional. Highly encourage that you read it. So welcome our guest, Dr. Joseph Doyle to the podcast. Give him your attention. Be curious, not judgmental to quote Ted Lasso. I am Scott Cunningham. This is the mixtape with Scott. Okay. Well, it is my pleasure uh, today to have Joseph Doyle, professor uh, at MIT's uh, uh, Sloan, Sloan School. Uh, of management here on uh, the second season of the podcast. Joe, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Well, so before we get started, you know, um, or this is the way to get started the, at the beginning, um, you know, I was just kind of curious you know, uh, to learn a little bit more about your, your, your childhood. Where did you grow up anyway? I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Famous for Joe Biden and The Office, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did your mom and dad do? My father was an elementary school principal. Oh. And my mom was a teacher, and then she uh, moved to uh, sell insurance. Oh, wow. 
Was she a teacher in his school? No. No, that would have been awkward. It's the same school district, you know. Scranton's yeah, not that school. big. That's right. That's right. Uh, um, and so did your dad, did he, did he, was he a principal his, the, for like most of his career or did he sort of go, what, what's the career path for a principal? Do you want to be a superintendent? He was something? a middle school history teacher and then he moved to be an elementary school principal. And okay. as, I was like, as soon as I was born, before I was born, he was a principal. So he's always a principal to me. Oh, uh, okay. And do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have three sisters, three older sisters. So I'm the youngest of four. Okay. Did, does your family still live in Scranton? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you drive. Yeah, so we go back. there. It's a, I live in Boston, so it's like a five hour drive. So it's, it's not too bad. Okay. Okay. So you drive. So, that, so it's like, uh, it, it, it's this famous town now because of the office. Everyone who I tell I from Scranton, yeah, it was definitely the office for many years. Now Biden comes up a lot too. He comes up a lot too. Okay, that's cool. Well, so when you were a kid, I was just kind of curious. If, if, was there a vacation that you went on as a kid that you sort of have a fond memory of? Well, we'd go to the Jersey Shore, and I loved going there. My before we would go, I couldn't sleep the whole night. Like I was just so excited to go to the Jersey Shore. We went to Cape May, New Jersey, and. Uh, I loved swimming in the ocean there and uh, going to the arcade across the streets. And um, I don't know, we just had such a good time uh, going on these like one or two week vacations every summer. Oh, that's cool. So what's the water like? Is it, is it pretty clear up there or is it, is it, is it, is it warm in the summer? Yeah, it's warm. And I mean, compared to New England, it's balmy compared to Florida. It's cold, Yeah, but I liked it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. My dad taught me how to ride waves, body surf, essentially. So you jump with the wave and uh, he was really good at it. Like when he would do it and like all these kids like would run around and like, oh, how'd you do that? And then he taught me how to do it. And um, I still love doing that today. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So uh, so if, if I could have had like uh, um, if I could have peaked on your uh, kind of like elementary, middle school years, you know, uh, what, what, what kind of kid were you? What were your hobbies? Well, I would play baseball every day in the summer. Where I just walk to the uh, playground, and my friends would be there. Sometimes we play basketball, but usually we play baseball. And then I got into tennis when I was in late elementary school, so I started playing that and biking to the uh, public tennis court a lot. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was. I joked with my kids, you know, we, I just left the house in the morning and came back when the, when the lights came on, uh, on the, you know, the street lights come on, that's when you have to go home. <laughs> right. right. It's very different than now when we, everything's organized, uh, yeah. you know, sporting events are organized. It's very important to me. So I just like to go to the playground, you know, and, and there'd be, my friends would be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There was like a, that was the, um, the focal point was the play, playground. Uh, I, I know it's funny. I, I grew up in Mississippi and that's exactly what it was like for me too. just riding my bike everywhere. Um, it was wonderful. What was Scranton like when you got into high school? Did it ever have any drug problems? I had a fantastic high school. Pardon me? Did it ever have any drug problems, Scranton, when you were in high school? I mean, like every high school, there are kids who use drugs. It wasn't. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't think it was like disabling. I, the, we had two uh, high schools. Well, three, but where I lived, you could choose between two. One was a tech school where you'd learn trades, and then there was an academic school mm. for college prep. So I went to the college prep one. Mm. And then, interestingly, my my school closed when I was a junior, and they consolidated the tech school and the academic school. We all had to move over to the, to the tech school, the physical location. So it was my uncle who went to the tech school and always joking with me about, you know, because I like to, I like school, as you might imagine. Yeah. So he's like, "Oh, now you go to my my alma mater now." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what did you like in high school? What were what were the subjects you liked? Well, I, I think I had I didn't really like school until I got to high school, mm -hmm. and my first my when I was a freshman, I had I don't know if I got lucky or not, but I had really great teachers, like mm -hmm. one after the next. So my favorite teacher was this Mr. Festa who taught uh, um, civics, government. And he was hilarious and he treated us like adults and the material was really interesting thinking about limits of government or um, mm -hmm. 
you know, thinking about politics for the first time, but with this really funny um, teacher. And, you know, he really was super engaging and that got me really interested in, in school. And then, you know, I really liked my science teacher, you know, that material was boring if I remember. And then the, the, the math program was really good. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a math teacher who taught Latin and she was um, very strict. And, but over the course of the year, she would melt into like someone that you really got along with. So she, you know, it was a great learning environment. In fact, one, she used to have you go to the board and, um, and, and do a problem. She would give you the problem. And yeah. as soon as you made a mistake, she would throw chalk. So the chalk would just explode <laughs> next. <time. laughs> so as I got to know her and we liked each other, um, I decided I would have to have chalk at the ready. So she made a mistake one time. She went to reach for the uh, eraser and then boom, I, I had thrown the chalk. <laughs> and then she looked around to see who did it. And she started chuckling at that point because she was already like, it wasn't like I was being rude. It was just like, right. A that was like that. Doing everything, it softened. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So, but that's funny you mentioned that guy. So, uh, but you you know, it, it's funny you mentioned both of them. Both of these kind of teachers that were sort of uh, kind of had all this like soft skill, kind of uh, you know, uh, th this ability to kind of connect with you. But then that that one professor you mentioned, he was he was talking to you about economic topics. You mentioned like limited, limited government, and but it was like, it was, it, you said it was civics? So yeah, it was like history, our first history, actually it was history, history and oh. civics together. I don't know why they put these together. It was like growth of Western civilization and civics. I don't know what, you know, yeah. what, in the infinite wisdom of what to teach freshmen that came up as like what, probably some requirement that we had to have civics at some point during our, our years. Um, yeah, so we started with, you know, cave, cave people and then right. ended up with the, uh, U.S. president or something, but yeah, uh, I should say another thing. I had a drama teacher, and Mrs. Langen, and she would uh, she was the head of our speech and debate club, and she was kind of a legend in Pennsylvania speech and debate. And our high school would win the state championship almost every year, mm. um, and that included a play that we put on in the fall, and then um, a competition throughout the year for um, various speech events and debate events. So I did debate and uh, she had a big influence on me as well. Well, how, what was so influential about her? How are you different? Because well, I took her class a couple times drama. So you'd have to get up in front of people mm. and I give myself, uh, I'm not a great public speaker, but I, I'm not nervous. And I give her a lot of credit for getting me, you know, shedding any kind of real nerves about speaking in public. Mm. Um, and that's a real skill because it's, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they rank that up there as one of the most fearful things to do. But since <laughs> right. I had to get up in front of people like weekly to do some kind of dialogue or something, it just got me out of my shell. Uh, and, uh, yeah, now I'm a teacher, right? So it just comes in really handy to right. just be super comfortable in front of a crowd. Right. That would not have been something that you say, like, you would have enjoyed, uh, like, absent, absent practice or something like that right exactly yeah i learned how to do learned how to do it oh that's interesting did you hear of anything like economics when you were in high school yeah so when i was in debate when we had debate. a debate coach who taught us uh some economics because i was in policy debates and there was often a, like sort of a cost benefit uh comparison and so we would think how would how would you what kind of language would you use to describe that and economics came in and in fact we had a uh, a program in the summer that would at the University of Scranton that attracted people from the area to learn how to debate. And they would teach, they had a few lectures in, in economics um, mm. as part of that summer. So I remember <laughs> learning about comparative advantage, um, maybe a little causal inference, but mostly it was uh, uh, micro, micro theory and, and thinking about how to think about welfare. What did you think about that? When you heard it, was it was it like when you were that young, was it just like one of a million things you were learning about or did it sort of stand out as a little bit a little bit more interesting than the other things? Yeah, I give a lot of credit to that to, for my interest in economics to begin with. The, basically, my people who went to high school before me would teach in this and they were now at college and they so they would teach us some of the cool things I learned in economics 101 kind of 
Mm -hmm. like I said, comparative advantage or even demand, where does demand come from and how do you think about consumer surplus? So um, yeah, it just struck me as like a logical way of thinking about public policy evaluation. Yeah. And so I went to, I went to college really loving uh, this idea of policy evaluation. That was like something that I, I got a big kick out of. So I wanted to learn the tools to do that. So you're, you're I, interesting. It seemed like if you looked at me now, you would say that I charted like the perfect straight line. I'm mean, going to, it's never like that. Right. But yeah. uh, somehow there were the, the seeds were planted early. Yeah. So you're one of these economists that, you know, like public policy was kind of the, was the horse pulling the wagon a little bit. Like you were first and foremost interested in policy. Yeah, absolutely. How come? What fact, is I went to Cornell. Go ahead. I went to Cornell undergrad and my major was this policy analysis major, which now oh. it's a, they actually named the department now policy analysis and management. Yeah. So I was one of the early uh, policy analysis students at Cornell. Yeah. Did, did you, did, did you have a sense in high school that those math courses were probably going to be useful if you were interested in policy or was that just sort of like you, you weren't thinking a lot about math back then? In high school, you know, I took the usual math with uh, calculus at the end. I just thought that was sort of the, the course to go to go through. Um, I hadn't really thought about applying it so well to uh, policy analysis at that point. But well, what drew you to policy? Why? Why is it? You know, it's funny when I think about the University of Chicago, which we're going to get into in a minute. Because of my interest in Becker, you know, for a long time, I was just interested in this pure behavioral, pol like behavioral uh a pro positive economics and it, it's funny i i taught this history of economic thought class in the fall and we went from adam smith to marx and you know the thing that really surprised me was how really behavior isn't really what unites the classical economists uh as much as uh an interest in public policy that the, that the economists have always been you know, interested in kind of fixing things. Uh, and so, you know, why, why did you, what is it about public policy that, you know, that, that's always drawn you to it? Because you could have said, you know, you were interested in all kinds of stuff, causal inference or anything, but what, what is it about public policy that's all, that appealed to you from such an early age? Well, I've just wanted to, always been really interested in what programs help people and which ones are wasteful. Like, mm -hmm. Basically, I want to improve people's lives, so then you have to know, measure how, what works and what doesn't. And um, there's so many good policy questions. I mean, there are other ways to help people too, through um, private business and so on, but somehow government policy, you know, there's a lot of debates about what should we do. And I thought economics gave you the framework to actually think about it in a logical way. Mm. Um, and that, that excited me at an early age. And, you know, it's, it's never sort of left me. Now, Becker, I went to Chicago you know, partly because of Becker. Um, oh, really? And when you think about economics of crime, yeah, that's a very public policy question. Very interesting one. All right. Maybe we'll get, um, get it into it, but I'm studying uh, child welfare, child protection. There are some things that it's really hard to know the answer to. So like how aggressive should we be in, uh, in policing crime, or how how aggressive should we be in protecting children? Um, if you take if you are really aggressive and you, you investigate every family for child abuse and neglect, you're going to be taking a bunch of kids away from their parents, and so there's a cost to that. And then if you leave too many kids at home, then they're going to be kids abused and neglected. And so I honestly don't know the answer uh, to, but I think it's a extremely important question. So. How can we start to think about that? There are various lenses to look at it, but I've always thought economics was a, it just clicked with me as a way to logically explore questions like that. Even at Cornell, you, you, this started to emerge at Cornell that I want to go you into. Know, my office. honors thesis at Cornell was in foster care. Uh, oh, wow. And trying to estimate a supply curve for foster parents was what I could get data for and, you know, oh, estimate something in undergrad. So, so how did you get interested in foster care? How did, how did that even happen? Well, I um, I got a fellowship at Cornell called the Cornell Tradition, and they would subsidize work. Um, 
And so I had a bunch of RA jobs. And then in the summer, they would give you a little extra money because they expect if you're going to do, go work for a think tank or a policy institute or something, you're not going to make the money that you would normally make. So they actually made up for the fact that you're not going to work as a lifeguard or something. And oh. uh, so it was a great program to like really encourage work. And one summer, actually, I was assigned, this is like my sophomore year, I was assigned uh, to look into international adoption policy and how it's evolved over time and what are the trends and so on. And once I started looking into that, I, and I, I was thinking about adoption. And once you start thinking about adoption, you start thinking about other ways, pathways into adoption and foster care is one of them. So this was pretty early on in my undergrad. And then it turns out that Cornell is a great place to do child welfare research. They have an institute there now that's grown out of their natural interest in foster care that they, it's like the national warehouse of data on foster yeah, care. Yeah, that data it's, it's set. Sorted. What's that data set? Is it AFCARS? Is there? Well, there's N NCANS. NCANS. Is the one that they store, which is a child abuse and neglect uh, data yeah. set. And then they have AFCARS. Did you use, did you use NCANS for any of your, re have you ever used NCANS for any of your research? I use, we got it I one haven't, time, but I never used it. I just, I remember that now. I haven't thought about that in years. Yeah, I've used it. I've definitely, I don't think I've ever published on it, but I yeah. definitely, I got access to it. I was looking at what I could answer with it. Right. Um, I never came up with a good, good enough idea to use yeah. it with statistical precision. Right. That's kind right. of the fun part about research, right? Um, you have a hundred ideas and five of them are going to work or 10 of, 10 of them might work. So um, I had plenty of ideas for NCANS, but I never got a paper out of it. Yeah. I guess in my thesis, I used a, uh, I hand collected data on uh, monthly payments made to foster parents by state year over some panel. And then I collected uh, foster care placement rates, like share of the population in foster care. And I basically uh, regressed one or the other and I called it a supply curve. <laughs> so, yeah, right, right. Um, I had actually a little structural model. It's funny, I, not, I don't do structural economics, but I had a little, you know, price theory model. And oh, there yeah? were shortages. So with a shortage, if you raise the wage, you'll trace out the supply curves. Oh, and yeah, so sure. Like a nice little model. But, That's nice. Yeah. Wait, yeah. So, so wait, there was a shortage of, of, of who? Of case? Foster parents. Of foster parents. No, foster parents. Of foster parents. And then I had the wage that they offer the foster parents. And then oh, you raise the wage. On the, you're on the supply curve you're going to right. trace up a, and it was upward sloping so you know it must be a supply curve right yeah that's right that's right well do you remember what the elasticity was uh, i think it was 0.3 huh has anybody ever done it but that's a you know you're straining my memory and my abstract and my <laughs> yeah, I, I did i made a promise me. not to make you remember any numbers well i wonder if anybody has done that before has anybody estimated the supply curve for foster care have you ever seen that? I mean, you're the expert. I actually haven't. I've ever... seen other people do similar things, but, and yeah, I think um, not quite the way that we did it with like this little structural model and like a reason why we might think it does supply. Yeah. It does trace out a supply curve. Uh -huh. um, it's hard to get variation in what we pay foster parents. That's, mm. you know, beyond this sort of state year uh, number. Those are pretty, um, crude because the payments will vary a lot by the type of case. And so then if you see mm -hmm. the payments are going up, then the cases are probably changing. So I'm, actually the, my crude measure is probably pretty clean because it was like a median number. Right. That probably wasn't so affected by that. But if you go into the micro data and you start to try to correlate these things, which I've seen done, it's not very convincing because I see. it's so tied into the type of case. Got it. Got it. So you end up at Cornell, even though you don't major in economics, there's something happens at Cornell because you're like, uh, you mentioned Becker, you, you, you want to go to Chicago or you just kind of apply everywhere and, and Chicago is the one that you end up choosing or, or was it you were really kind of were wanting to go to Chicago? Well, I loved Chicago. I liked, I loved um, Becker's research in undergrad um, okay. and my, the person I RA'd for, uh, Dean Lillard, went to Chicago. And so he was always kind of an evangelist for Chicago. Uh, and, and 
from Becker. So anyway, I, I was definitely read a ton of Becker and, and undergrad. And then I applied everywhere. Uh, the New York Fed between the under micro section of the Fed. So it wasn't a macro job, but it was in the research department. Right. And, and then I applied everywhere and the best place I got into was Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I know a lot about Chicago and nothing about Chicago at the same time. Uh, Chicago, Chicago was um, the thing that got me to want to become an economist. And it was reading Becker and it was reading uh, the law and economics papers that uh, that that were sort of stored there in that tradition. Um, but uh, I was curious, um, you know, if you remember, if you could kind of just, you know, for the sake of like a, a a young student that's listening, or even a PhD student now that you know doesn't know what it's like to go to Chicago in 1998, what was it like? Kind of, you know, what was it like as a as you sort of stepped into Chicago in, in 98? Uh, how would you describe what it felt like? Well, Chicago had a, a, a tough reputation. It was very tough to go to grad school there. People fail the first year, yeah. which a lot of other programs do not fail people the first year. At least that's the reputation. So they said, you know, you, in some previous years, not too long before I got there, half the half the students would fail. They would actually let tons of kids, in, students into the program, and then they'd fail half of them. And then, you know, that's a, that's a tough way to start your uh, grad school. School career. Now, when I got there, they had reduced it a little, so the size wasn't. They 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 ended that experiment to some extent, but we were still on the high end in terms of the size, and there was still this threat that 20, 30 percent of kids were going going to fail. Yeah. So that definitely put uh, a lot of pressure on. And then that's the most uh, work I've ever done is that first year. You know, just they just load you up with tons of of work that you have to get done and there's not enough time to do it. And so you just work all the time. Right. Uh, and so it's, you know, and you want it to, you, at the end of the year, it's, it's quite rewarding that you've just, uh, it seems like a major accomplishment. Like you are smarter at the end of that year. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You, but you, you put your nose to the grindstone for a year and doing what, anything what, all day, every day, you're going to be good at it at the end and right. feel a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. So, so you you were in that. Becker, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Yeah. So you were in that Becker Murphy famous Becker Murphy price theory class. What do you what What was that like? What yeah, was I love like that class. For, what was it like? What was Becker like as a professor? Charming and obviously, if there are only some certain people when you like when they're helping you discover something that you're just. Um, really enjoying the ride of, of, of trying to figure it out. And then he has his own quirks. Like he can't read his handwriting. And so we'd all kind of make fun of that. And uh, it made, no. you, made you pay attention more because you could never catch up later yeah. to see what he wrote because you had no idea. Do you ever throw um, chalk? So that's at, actually a technique. Did you ever throw chalk at Gary Becker when he made a mistake? No, no, no chalk was. Oh, me. really? Okay. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> it was in this really cool auditorium with leather seats and it was. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just you knew that. Um, I think uh, Knight had taught the course, and Friedman had taught the course, and now it was Becker and Murphy, and then yeah. it's just this long history of three hundred one. It was it was fun to be there, and then at in the middle of the lecture, he would ask a question, and then he'd start looking down the list of student names, and then he would so, and then he'd call a name and cold call on you. So as he's looking down that list, of everyone's like, I mean, my heart, and he would be pounding a little, like I wonder if he's going to ask. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, what do you, what are your memories of Kevin Murphy? How does he? How was he similar, and how was he different from Becker in that class? It was what was it like? Price theory one and two, or something? It was three hundred one. The um, Chicago's on a quarter system, so there are three uh, courses in micro in the first year, uh -huh. and they were the first. So okay. they were like you know September till Thanksgiving or something. Yeah, and. Becker and Murphy was, you know, again, super smart and um, clear. Everything was very clear. Yeah. In fact, it was so clear that afterwards you were like, that was really easy. And then if you asked to explain it, like you had trouble explaining it because <laughs> you could never do it as well as him. One of those, it was so obvious. Well, the way he said it was so obvious and later on it didn't seem as obvious. Whereas Becker, you had to like think it was, there were hard questions and 
he didn't write clearly and you had to sort of stick with them. So it was, yeah. it was a different style. Yeah. Uh, well, did you, when you got there, uh, so what's it like at Chicago? What was it like at Chicago for you in sort of this like matching process with, with both your research, but also the matching process with your advisor? What is that? What was that like for you? You know, was it, was, was it something that like, you know, you, it took you a long time or, I mean, cause you graduated really fast. So I'm assuming it wasn't, didn't take you a long time, but what was that process like? Well, I went in really interested in family, you know, child welfare, family yeah. economics. And so who better than economics to the family, uh, Becker to, 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 right. uh, to step in to just pick his brand. And then he taught a, health, a human capital class with a lot of the, you know, rotten kid theorem and, um, you know, a lot of family economics, human capital oh, formation. So together. my field course not... the same was fantastic. So wait, he's your advisor? No, I, in fact, that's one of the things I've regret is not having him on my committee. Um, I ended up having Steve Levitt as my advisor. Oh, okay. Um, who was very welcoming and a very nice, he could just tell he was a very nice guy and it was he was going to guide me. Um, I always, I probably shouldn't have thought this because a lot of people worked with Becker, but um I always thought maybe if I'm not at the top of the class, you know, Becker's, you know, used to working with the top, top students. Mm -hmm. And I was not in the top, top of my 301. I wasn't asked to uh, TA micro. I was asked to TA econometrics. So we have this common in, uh, interest in econometrics. Yeah. And that's where I shined more was in econometrics. Uh -huh. But not so much in micro, but I'd love micro. So I probably should, I would meet with him quarterly maybe to talk about my research. And so that was... I felt like he was an advisor, but not, he wasn't somebody who signed my, uh, or wrote a letter for me. It's so interesting but because that foster care uh, is such a blend of his work on crime and his work on family, but I can't remember hearing him talk much about it, you know, like thinking, because in, in so, you know, you've got basically uh, abuse or neglect of, of children by caregivers or parents and the government removing them. Even when you were talking earlier, it felt like a real Beckerian framework of like, you know, the 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 cost of the offense, the cost of the abuse and the neglect, and the the costs of of the removals. You know, and so it seems like you know it, it's funny. I actually hadn't myself, even though I've written about foster care, I hadn't really thought about it. In that's I hadn't really ever thought about it in a Beckerian framework before. So you were kind of. So what did he think about what you were working on? He loved it, yeah. So we would talk about, you know, he has an altruism model. Yeah. Very simple model where the utility of the parents and the kids, the parents care about the kids' utility. Um, and they have a weight on the kids' utility and their own utility. Um, and that weight could be pretty small, you know, or negative, if, you know. So you can start to think about where does maltreatment come from? What kind of model would you think about for even thinking about maltreatment? Right. And then it's economics of crime as yeah. well would be right in there as in terms of deterrence or. Um, but you felt. But I also remember the Chapin Hall, the Chapin Hall Center for Children is at the University of Chicago. And that's a, if you were into foster care research as a undergrad, like you knew the Chapin Hall Center for Children, they, they, they have a data warehouse there, not only for Illinois, but they had a multi-state data warehouse mm. for foster care. And so. The first day I was on campus, I just went there and I ended up being a, an employee there, uh, like an RA there uh, from my sophomore year, or maybe even the summer after my first year. Did your dissertation, it was an empirical paper? Yeah, foster care. Uh, is it I one of the papers on foster it's care? It's not the AERJP stuff, is it? I'm trying to remember now. I definitely, um, no. What it was, was I had, there was a reform that paid relatives less to take care of foster kids. So there was a policy reform that lowered the wage that they offered relatives to take care of foster kids. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was a really unique opportunity to learn about altruism. Right. By if one day they're going and saying, hey, grandma, would you want, would you take the kid for $400 a month? And then the next day, a different grandma is saying, hey, do you want, would you take the kid for 250 a month? 
Yeah. And we, I found that there was a big uh, drop in the willingness of relatives to take care of kids when they um, got less money. And then I was curious would the quality of the foster parents improve or decline because you may have a selection of only the ones who either could afford it or love the kid more. Yeah. And uh, I found that the quality stayed the same, suggesting that the marginal grandparents, the ones that are, uh, mo are influenced by the money, are similar quality to the non-relatives. And it's one of the few papers that tries to compare non-relatives and relatives at all, because it's really hard to compare right. because of the selection into the, whether you can find a relative to take the kid. But here I had the shock. So anyway, I needed to have uh, an instrument, sample selection instrument, going back to my Heckman uh, yeah. TA job. Uh, you know, and the instrument I came up with was a leniency, uh, was a pr leniency propensity. Really? Uh, back in OT? And then, yeah, you, and then you had that, in O2? that made me think that was back in O2. And then uh, I said, well, I should use this instrument for something that's even more important, which is not just getting into my stupid sample, yeah. but do you go to foster care at all? Yeah. And so that was my first real big project when I got out of grad school was I, I have this cool instrument, let me use it. And then I realized that Jeff Kling had used the judge instrument before, like, sort of independently, but I gave him a lot of credit for, you know, thinking about how to actually do it and so on. So um, well, what were you yeah, doing? I was one of the early propensity Besi guys. Well, bes besides using it as a sample selection instrument, what was, what, how would you say it was different? It was still a, it was still like a leave one out kind of propensity type thing. Yeah, it was just, I wanted, uh, I needed, I wanted an instrument for going into foster care because if you had to go be going into foster care to be approaching the grandparents with the wage offer, and that was a selected sample and so on. So I said, okay, well, I need an instrument. And then I just use a control function. So it wasn't, it was, it, it's a less interesting way to use the instrument than in the end because I, it was like almost like a robustness check in my dissertation paper. But it was kind but of, then it out turned into like the focal. But it, it kind of captivated you a little bit. Well, I've always been interested in the question of the optimal removal rates and so on. So hmm. uh, it wasn't that I wasn't interested in that. It was just that I had this other idea that I needed to solve a problem, a uh, sample selection problem. And when I solved that, I said, well, I could use this to answer the question I've always been interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you didn't do that in the dissertation, though. That that came later. The, the, I can't remember if it ended up at chapter, but I uh, I don't think it did. Yeah. But it was in when I talked to people on the job market, I was like, oh, no, I'm definitely doing, you know. It, yeah, it turned out my job market paper was a health paper. But I would I spent most of my job market interviews talking about child welfare. But of course, they want to talk about your job market paper. Right, right, well. right, right. Yeah. What did Levitt think about it? I'm sure you're going to tell me super nice. And it sounds like, you know, you probably, what, what do you think you got out of that relationship with Levitt? So that had been like, oh, 98 to 02. I mean, it's like way before Freakonomics, but he still got this, you know, strong reputation of being like, you know, a, 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 kind of like a credibility revolution guy. Uh, wh what did it, what did it feel like, you know, kind of looking back? I mean, because I mean, in some ways, like, he he just had such a profound effect on the field of crime. You know, it's not really always appreciated, I don't think, uh, just how disruptive he was in just, you know, just doing such high quality work in crime. Um, what was it like back then working with him or working under him? I mean, I was super excited to work with him because um, I remember he gave a talk in my first year econometric sequence just like one day Levitt's there and he's talking about how, how do you come up with that research ideas and it was just like really good really good advice you know about failing quickly and like mm. see if you, you should see if you could see a relationship like if you have an idea in raw data do you actually see it might work in raw data and then if it does then you it lowers the uh, risk of spending a lot more time getting better data and so on so mm -hmm. he just had nuts and bolts advice for people and he came from uh, from Cambridge, where people. I'm in Cambridge now. I guess I get the sense then and now that, um, well, for, certainly then, that the graduate students were uh, were treated very well at MIT. Um, yeah. They so he that. brought that with him to Chicago. 
Yeah, he thought that was in the Chicago. So he's just like one of the nicest professors at Chicago. So like, so I just gravitated to that. And then he spent a lot of time with me and helped me a lot learning mm. how to do research. So less about, I took his crime. He had a crime class, um, but it was mostly about how do you answer questions. And uh, it was really, to me, just so supportive that uh, I naturally gravitated to her, toward that. Mm. So was Heckman on your committee? No. Uh, so I, te I TA'd for Heckman. I learned a ton from Heckman. Uh, I knew people who were, he was on their committee. And uh, it was known to be a very stressful relationship because you would learn so much, but then uh, you have to convince him that you are, you should be able to graduate now. And he often thought you needed a little more seasoning. Yeah. Whereas I think a lot of it was a little more hands-off. Like when you want to go, you can, you can go. Mm. And I was engaged to be married and I kind of wanted to have my own, uh, I wanted to have a little more control. Right. For when I could leave. Right. Uh, right. Got a lot of research done and I could leave it on a month ago. Yeah. 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 So you and uh, this is going to be random, but uh, it, in my brain, it makes sense. So y you and Ed Vicatol, y'all sort of overlapped for a couple of years. Did y'all know each other? Yeah, sure. He was the TA maybe uh, a year or two before me, and he was super nice guy. Um, and yeah, there was a point in my career, and I, my my wife will attest to this. About I had to decide whether to to become a Heckman RA or a Levitt RA, and I just went with with Levitt. But that was a big decision, and yeah. I, I, at the time, I was you know very <laughs> which way I should go. Right, right. Yeah, I've heard um, I, I've heard other people that, that, that having to make that decision. The reason why I asked about Vicodol is, you know, I had never seen um, anybody do marginal treatment effects until until you. And um, and so I was just kind of wondering, like, you know, were, were was that like when you decided to do it, were was this just kind of was this something that you had you were watching a lot of people do that you you had. We're, we're thinking that this would be valuable to kind of estimate these marginal treatment effects within this leniency design, or, I mean, I'm just curious what, what it was like, uh, you know, if, if you sort of learned that at Chicago or was it stuff that you got later? No, it's definitely, uh, in my, I was in econometrics, uh, my, one of my fields was econometrics and it was definitely in the air. Yeah, uh, at the time with Heckman and Bitlasil there, talking about marginal treatment effects and Pedro Carnero. Mm. Um, Pedro taught me um, the most. I didn't understand the first three times I heard about. I knew it was interesting, but I was like, I I don't understand what they're talking about. And then Pedro walked me through it, and I understood it very well. Mm. So I give a lot of credit to Pedro. Mm. And then. When I had, you need a continuous instrument, and now they can do it with binary, but I, I think it's still better with continuous. And uh, so here I had this continuous instrument, and then I realized it was actually a pretty cool setting to do the MTE, uh, because the shape of the MTE tells you about uh, the unobservables of the population that you're studying and the complier. So it would just seem like a really cool application of MTE. And I honestly think a lot of people didn't understand what they were talking about either, <laughs> like, like yeah. a normal grad student, but I did. It's yeah because i had studied so often and i had these mentors like pedro um and then even the way they had <laughs> and i think that uh, I, I take some pride in like translating what they were doing into like this isn't that hard it's actually pretty easy to think about right and then um i still remember josh angrist uh, we thought they might have a rivalry with heckman i don't know how much rivalry they had or didn't but um for whatever reason, Angus didn't really like this MTE approach. And then I pointed yeah. out to him that he did the MTE in a very intuitive way in another paper. He didn't call it MTE, but it was still the same thing. And he's like, oh, well, then that that makes some sense. So yeah. it's like the way I see it is very, very reasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bringing peace to the land. You're just, you're, uh, there you go. Na okay. Nature's healing. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, so, okay. Um, so th this this work that you end up I should, wait, I should say Robert Muff, Robert Muffet 
was my editor on the AER paper and he helped me refine the MTE as well. So like, I, I definitely wanted to apply it there, but he helped a lot too. So I don't want to get that. Yeah. Well, you know, so I don't want to take, uh, assume that the, the people listening, you know, sort of are aware of, of the, these, this, this kind of pair of foster care papers. If, if you could just kind of give like uh, the, the elevator pitch about, you know, what, what those two, that AER, American Economic Review article on the Journal of Political Economy paper about foster care removal and these outcomes. I was just kind of curious if you wouldn't mind sort of setting it up. Yeah, absolutely. So the research question is, what is the effect of removing kids from their parents who are suspected of maltreating the, the kid, removing them and placing them in foster care on long-term outcomes like their earnings and employment as young adults or their propensity to go into prison as adults. So um, if you look in the prison population, for example, a quarter of the people in prison had been in foster care as a youth. So there's just a very strong correlation there, but it's not obvious that foster care caused that. It's probably the maltreatment that led to foster care and also led to imprisonments. At the same time, I find this research question super interesting. Like, should we place kids in foster care or leave them at home? And which one should we remove and not? So if you just compare kids who went to foster care and those who didn't, then you'd have all this omitted variable bias. The kids who go to foster care have much worse unobservables probably than uh, the kids who are staying at home because they're being maltreated. Right. And so I had to come up with an idea, shocked. Some kids are going to go to foster care, come, some kids won't. And I, the idea I had what was- year is this? And what, after what, speaking, what year is this when you're, you're working on this for the first time? And you're at MIT? Uh, 1999, 2000. Oh, you, so this is even at Chicago where you're thinking about this removal. Yeah, because I worked at the Chapin Hall Center for Children, which is the repository for foster care data. And they have a lot of researchers doing foster care research. They had connections with the state of Illinois, mm. their Department of Children and Family Services. So not only did I get access to data, but institutionally, I could. I spoke with caseworkers. I learned how the process worked. How do kids get into foster care? Right. So it's, this is the fun part was listening for variation. Like they'll say, well, most kids go into foster care because of substance abuse by the parents, let's say. So that would be a terrible instrument for foster care placement. It won't be a good shock to foster care placement because parents who are abusing drugs may affect their kids badly in many ways beyond foster care. But then at one point they said, you know, we do an investigation with these investigators and I said, well, how do the investigators get assigned? And they said that it's on a rotation. They called it the rotation. Well, it's the rotation. The, depending on who the next case is, it just gets assigned to the next person. So that made me think, well, that sounds like it could be useful. And so the idea in the research design is that some kids are uh, investigated by investigators who place a lot of their kids in foster care. And other ones are investigated by ones that are uh, less likely to have kids placed in foster care. Mm -hmm. coupled with this random assignment of the kids to, to investigators. So you get this random shifter of whether you go to foster care or not. And then I just basically compare kids who are assigned to strict investigators to lenient ones. And I find that if you were just randomly assigned to a strict investigator, you're, much, you're more likely to go to foster care, as we right. might expect. Yeah. And then you're more likely to end up in prison 20 years later, mm -hmm. or you're less likely to be in the workforce. You're more likely to have a teen pregnancy. You're... Uh, you're more likely to end up in juvenile justice, uh, right. juvenile court. Right. And so why would assignment to a strict investigator have huge effects on your later life outcomes? I argue the main way is because they are more likely to have you placed in foster care. And so that's the idea behind the paper and the sort of- How did that make you the feel? Ability to, How did that make you feel to make that you result? Feel. You know, cause it's such a jarring, I mean, you've been thinking about foster care since Cornell, uh, Presumably, you know, I mean, did you have, I mean, I, you're, you're an empiricist, so you don't have any dog in it necessarily, but like, I, I could at least imagine you're like, this is an important program, helping kids, you know, get away from abusive parents is important. So therefore it will help them. And you're sort of like stuck with this big positive coefficient. What did that feel like? Was that hard for you? Well, one, I really didn't know which way it would go. Mm. I could have, if you talk with kids in foster care, they hate foster care. Right. I mean, a lot of people, if you look at documentaries or 
you talk with like they don't like foster care right um and so you hear all these bad stories of foster care was terrible you know and then you're like well your home life might have been terrible too so i don't know what yeah. the effect of being placed is it, maybe it's good or bad i i really didn't know and going back to the policy evaluation a lot of policies have drawn political lenses so that like for example like a minimum wage I would think Republicans hate it and Democrats like it. Like you kind of know mm -hmm. based on the politics, but child protection and all bets are off. Like if you are a small government Republican, you might not want them interfering with uh, family. Yeah. At the same time, if you're like a libertarian Republican, they usually say, let, let adults do whatever they want to do, but kids, you know, kind of have to protect kids. Like right. there's always this sort of, and so I could have imagined the government going too far and removing too many kids in this little model I had in my mind, there was asymmetric penalties for the investigators. If they leave a kid at home who gets harmed, they get in big trouble. Mm -hmm. But if they remove a kid and that kid is worse off 20 years later, like no one's going to pin the blame on them. So like there was this asymmetric incentive to remove too many kids. I thought the moral hazard would go that way. Mm. So I actually thought that might be the case. But I honestly didn't know the answer and I didn't really care. Like I didn't like wasn't rooting for an answer. Right. If it turned out that the marginal kids were better off, then we haven't gone far enough. If if they're worse off, we're probably going too far. Yeah. I didn't expect the magnitude. I find these big negative effects of being assigned to a strict investigator and suggesting yeah. that placement in foster care has big negative effects in Illinois in the 90s for marginal cases. So I, I spent a lot of time talking with reporters, trying to explain to them uh, lo local average treatment effects. Yeah, that's that good this, luck. Yeah. Does not mean foster care is bad for all kids. Yeah. It's only for the cases where the investigator uh, assignment matters. And I, I walk them through very carefully. Mm -hmm. And then, like the USA Today had a headline MIT study shows foster care is worse than leaving kids at home. And I'm like, that's not what I said. <laughs> yeah. <at all." laughs> They're not going to so, say uh, the foster care is worse for the, com the, 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 co the, co the complier. <laughs> it's hard right, to exactly. tell that story. That's a harder uh, thing to sell in a headline. Yeah, it's harder to sell. So that I actually felt worse about that. Yeah. That you might have thought I felt bad about these marginal kids. I actually felt bad about the inframarginal kids who are probably helped by foster care, but my research might be like misused. Yeah. yeah people yeah. won't give it the subtlety of the local average treatment effect. Well, so I mean, this is kind of a good a good point though. I mean, you know, you you've got these marginal treatment effects, and I'm kind of drawing a blank over what you if you use your marginal treatment effects to pull out these aggregate parameters, but you, you could have, is that what you did in there when you, you, you went from the marginal treatment effect to these like average treated on the treated and stuff? No, I didn't actually, I just used the typical instrumental variables to get the overall. And then I found that the MTE graphs were useful to explore where the overall came from. Mm. And I had support the probability that you go to foster care range from 10 to 30%, depending on which kind of investigator you got. And I was always uncomfortable extrapolating out. Yeah. All right, all right. But what I could say was within the 10 to 30, what I was most interested in was, is there something weird on the margins or is this basically like whether you go from a 10 to an 11 percentage point placement rate or a 29 to a 30, are they way different than each other? And it turned out they're relatively noisy. But I thought it was pretty flat. Like it really didn't matter where in the margin. And that made me think it wasn't unusual. Yeah. And it was just right on the knife's edge that this was bad for kids. I thought, no, it's actually bad for kids if you go from 11 to 12, yeah. as it is, and 29 to 30. And that suggests if you go from, you know, everybody would agree this kid needs to go to foster care, then obviously those kids are probably helped by foster care. But within this pretty wide range, 11, 10 to 30 percent, it was bad for kids no matter where. So yeah. to me, it was more of a robustness. That's a really cool way to explore that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. What was the people's reaction in the, like outside of econ? Like when you because you're sort of it seems like you've kind of got this connection at this point with like a, a more interdisciplinary because of that, you know, you, you worked with uh, um, with this foster care center. What what were how did they respond to it? Like in, anybody outside of econ with a strong interest in foster care and child welfare? Yeah, I speak with a lot of policymakers, uh, child advocates. There's been a big push at that time and continuing to like reduce the number of kids in foster care somehow mm -hmm. with more family preservation, more support to families as opposed to removals. And they took my results and ran with them, basically. They said, hey, this is like 
a proof of concept that we could be harming uh, kids with the current way we're operating our system. We're harming harming kids. Right. Um, if I found the other result, if I found something different, they would just would have ignored me. So I like to think of it. I'm just like to be realistic. Like we find these results, and then the people, the policymakers who like want to go a certain direction, they're probably going to latch onto that. But you, you know, I think we're in the business of just finding out whatever the data tell us. Yeah. Uh, but one thing I've been sort of, I don't want to be too uh, haughty about it, but like somewhat, I found it rewarding that the research has been used as a this kind of proof of concept. Like we need to be, we've always said we need to be careful about removing kids, but here we're seeing Illinois in the nineties was doing it in a way that was really harming kids right. who are on the margin of entry. Um, I think, I, so I've, I've just heard that echoed among the policymakers that speak to me anyway, that uh. my research in economics has made an impact on the child welfare policy world. Yeah. Um, Is that kind of what you were in, in that kind of even, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but when you were a kid in those, in that policy debate, you, you did sort of hope that you might have impact. Is that right? It wasn't just the intellectual discussions of policy. You were actually kind of hoping that you would ha make the world a little bit of a better place. Yeah. I wanted to inform policy with, with good evidence. So that's for sure. And then yeah. I've, like I said, I've gotten more realistic over time that, sometimes people want to do something and then they're they're going to look for the research that sort of backs up what they're saying but in my case hopefully people look at the research and say no this is a pretty credible way to go about it right um anybody could find data to support their side but the question is do you believe their results and so that's right. why having the natural experiments that are kind of easy to explain and are you know in the end of the day we're in the business of using data to tell a compelling story not just right. any story so right right I got to conclude it, but I just want to end this last thing, uh, you know, so one of my favorite papers, and I'm not just saying this, one of my, one of my absolute favorite papers, and I teach it all the time, is your juvenile incarceration paper with Anna Azer. And that's a, that's a, a distressing paper in a lot of ways, you know, it, it's, it's made me very emotional when I teach it. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, um, how did you and Anna meet anyway? That seemed like that was just like a perfect, you know, combination, the two of y'all. Yeah. Well, we had the same fellowship in grad school. Uh, the Social Science Research Council had uh, a fellowship that we both applied for somehow, you know, and then they had a, a, a like a retreat with, um, oh my God. Um, there were some really cool people. Ted Miguel, I think, was there. Uh, oh. These are young faculty members that came to help mentor grad students. Um, Wait, was Ray Anna, Fisman. Anna was at UCLA though, right? But Anna came to this retreat that she was a grad student, like I was a grad student. Oh. So as grad students, we came together for this SSRC retreat. I forget where it was, maybe at Duke or somewhere. And uh, they had these now famous, I think, economists that were right. very young, maybe first or second year out of grad school, mentoring us a bit, reading our papers. And we'd have like a workshop where we think about our papers. Yeah. Anyway, I met Anna there. I'm a huge fan of hers yeah. since then. And uh, when I got the opportunity, uh, we, I guess we've just been talking about research research projects and I had this access to this administrative data in Illinois. Yeah. And so the, I think that I forget who uh, came up with the research question, but we definitely thought it'd be fun to work together on that. And then I'm sitting at the MBER today and I remember sitting here with Anna. Maybe she was here for a year. I was definitely here for a year and uh, we got a lot of work done like on a, on a little junior leave and, uh, and, and bang that paper out. It was, it was a really fun time working with her. And it was, like you said, an important question, yeah. hard to answer. We had this propensity instrument that we used, like that people, we were getting good at using that. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. The, but you know, it's also the linkages, the, the, the all of these, uh, you know, the courts, linked to the high schools linked to the to the corrections facility i mean that that's you know there's a lot of things when i think about like the growth of you know ca the causal inference and stuff but like um one of the things that gets kind of smothered in the growth of like more identification tight clean natural experience etc one of the things that people don't see as much as this like huge data sets 
becoming available is one thing, but then people link in the people across the data sets. And um, I think that's one of the really cool parts of that paper um, was just like you tracking a, a kid from that juvenile court back to their high school using a completely, was that hard to do to get buy-in from these other agencies like, you know, Cook County ISD or whoever it was? Yeah, so this goes back to my days at Chapin Hall. So Chapin Hall had relationships, but you still had to apply for the data. I remember, I think for that paper, I flew to Chicago and like uh, there were, there was a stall and whether we could access data. And like, I like waited in a waiting room and talked to someone. Like I was like really eager to make it work, to get access to that data. So there was effort involved, but I had some expertise in linking data from helping Chapin Hall do that. And so we were standing on the shoulders of, of their relationships um, back in Chicago. So that's why a lot of my research is in using Chicago data because I made those relationships when I was a student there. Right, 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 right. Um, you know, the result in that paper that has always really just kind of haunted me is uh, they're less likely to go back to school, but if they go back to school, they are, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a kid and you're incarcerated, you know, under this randomized uh, judge design, then um, you're less likely to go back to high school or school. But if you do, you're going to have an emotional behavioral disorder, right? And that's sort of the result more likely to have that what was that that what that's if, right yeah what if people told what if pe- what, what's it been like to share that you know with policymakers uh you know like because in this age of mass incarceration you know it's funny you have this great statistic in the paper which is you know the united states also has the highest incarcerate juvenile incarceration rate uh and the in the one that comes in second is like south africa and it's we're five times higher or something. It was some kind of just obscene, you know, statistic. And just the thought of like the way that that paper lends itself is just to think, Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're just, we're, we're traumatizing the marginal kid is is, is the way I read it. Is is, is that sort of, yeah. Well, what's it been like, you know, to share that with policymakers? Have they been as much, has that been as, you know, you catch people's attention with that kind of thing? Yeah, so absolutely. There are, again, like I said, with child welfare, there are child advocates. There are also advocates to try to reduce yeah. juvenile incarceration. And they have used our paper to say, hey, the thing is trying to convince hard, on, tough on crime folks. And right. the, the fact that we found that you would increase crime was like a big you know, uh, arrow in their in their quiver. That's like you're not reducing crime; you're actually increasing crime. Now we could get into deterrence and so on, but basically, like you said, the idea that locking kids up traumatizes them, and then they most of them won't go back to school, or if they do, we, we actually see in the data this uh, emotional behavior disorder uh, cropping up. That this institution could be traumatizing these marginal kids. Yeah, we get people understand that actually, and so. One of the things, that, like you said, talking to grad students and so on, I did a lot of shoe leather research for that type of project where oh, when yeah. I was a, a student in Chicago, I visited the juvenile detention facility and met kids there, stu- you know, juveniles there. Yeah. Um, I sat through I sat through court cases in the juvenile court. Yeah. And you just hear like for a few days and I was recording data for another project, but it was just eye opening. Yeah. These court proceedings go through the the level of legal aid that people get was very immature mm. and then when you go to the uh the audi home it was called the the juvenile correction facility uh, it was just very depressing could very you depressing. could you sort of like describe uh like when you were watching what could you describe to me like Oh, so here's an example of a strict judge, and here's an example of a leniency judge, lenient judge. Like this is this is the kinds of stuff they did differently. Like because I've heard stuff on podcasts, like the serial podcast. It was like the third season where uh, there was, or I've seen documentaries where you know the the what appears to be like a strict judge almost seemed like 
way too micromanagey, you know, like, like, like almost kind of a sort of judgmental. And I was curious, like, did, did you ever kind of feel like you could, like, you had profiles or archetypes of like, this is what in Cook County, like a, a, a strict judge looked like versus this is what a lenient judge looked like? Well, first talking with lawyers in the system, they were not surprised at all that the luck of the draw on which judge is going to come before you will be a big determinant on the punishment. Like that was yeah. like, of course. Right. So that made me feel really strong about the idea. Like the practitioners are like, this is, it was obvious to them that that would be a big deal. Yeah. And these judges have reputation. They have reputations of being. Yeah. And some certain. of them were prosecutors before, and some of them were defense mm -hmm. attorneys before. Mm -hmm. A limitation of the paper is we don't know a lot about the judges in terms of characteristics. So we can't really describe them that way. In fact, some of the research I'm doing now is looking more into can we characterize the judges and so on, but right. um, which I find to be really interesting in its own yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that probably a feature to, into those strictness and lenience is like that whether you were a prosecutor or a defense attorney might sort of predict your kind of habits or your attitudes? That's the hypothesis. Yeah. Like the yeah. prosecutors think all the all the people are guilty and guilty. The, the public defenders are trying to help. <sighs> That's a something to test. I don't know. Yeah, that's something to test. That's really interesting. Um, well, I we've gone over a little bit, Joe. You know, it's it is interesting. I didn't realize it. I didn't know what I was going to hear, but um, you you do have this kind of uh, shoe. What you said, shoe leather. You you can I can hear it in the way that you've approached research questions. It's not just that you're smart. It's not just that you kind of have this natural experiment. Like when you said that you sat down with, with like uh, an agency and just was listening to what I would just kind of call the treatment assignment mechanism, just kind of like, you know, how exactly is the treatment being assigned to people? And you were, it sounds like you just have an ear for, for uh, random, ran, randomness, first of all, but, but this kind of humility, you're like, just, I'm going to go talk to these people. You know, I think like that's not always what that's not always what, uh, you know, not 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 every economist has that reputation. You know, they just kind of download the data set. And uh, but it seems like you're out there talking to people. Is that accurate? I just my best ideas have come from listening to the people who actually assign the treatment. Like, how does this happen? Right. Um, and I'm definitely always listening for you know, what could be a good shifter of a shock to getting that treatment. So that applies to my healthcare research for sure. And, sure. and this child welfare research too. So. Yeah. Yeah. But that's my advice to grad students. Yeah. Is to get out of your office and, and talk to people who are in the setting where you're interested in. If you're interested in employment then go to an employment office and, and yeah. see what they're, how they're trying to help people. You can just get ideas anyway. Yeah. 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 You know, I remember like uh, I, the one thing is I, I think it's like, you know, well, a lot of people really like, you know, nobody really wants to, nobody's really curious about their job. And so to a lot of people enjoy, you know, talking to a student who's genuinely curious about like an unbelievable amount of minutia, you know, I mean, like it doesn't have to be like the, uh, I had that too. I was, I was working on um, the mental health courts in Travis County and um, I was interviewing this, I was taking this public defender out to uh for burritos and um you know just kind of being like okay walk me through again just exactly how do you get into um mental health court like you know why why are they going to mental health court obviously because they're mentally ill but like you know what is exactly happening and then you know you can't ask them what what's a good instrument you know because you, you have to just kind of they don't even know what to tell you so the only thing i just figured out is like I need you to walk me through the treatment assignment. And, and sometimes you'll be surprised. They'll, they'll say, oh, there's a, um, uh, when they're in jail, there's a score that they're given and we only take people above a certain number. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's, uh, th this was worth every burrito that I just bought you. You know, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I always tell students that too, it's just, how how important it is just to go out there and listen um uh you just don't you know just kind of like cast a wide net and just listen 
Um, yeah. It's really, really, it's a big part of research when you're not doing randomized trials, you know? Great. Well, it's such a pleasure, Joe, to meet finally face to face. Um, I've been such a big uh, admirer of your work for a long, long time. Cause you know, I, I've, I love the leniency design. I'm like the last person to, you know, even learn it. It's like, there's now like 5 million papers that, that do it. You got to be the, the first guy to do it, but like, um, but uh, I also, you know, used to write on foster care and I just read those papers so closely and I just really enjoyed it. Um, so it's really neat to meet. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you, you giving me an hour of your time. No, I'm a big fan of your uh, podcast here. And so it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Great. Great. Okay. Well, you have a great day. You gotta see us through.